Welcome back uh, to the disarmament orientation course and welcome to module two, which is on weapons of mass destruction. We will cover nuclear weapons as well as biological weapons and a little bit of chemical weapons also. The first issue, however, is the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty and Richard Lenin will be speaking to Gauka Mukatsanova, who is director of the International Organizations and Non-Proliferation Program at the James Martin Center for Non-Proliferation Studies. Gauka is one of the leading experts on the NPT and she works from the Vienna Center for Disarmament and Non-Proliferation. As we record this, the date for the next, the 10th NPT review conference has not been finalized. The situation was actually the same in last year's recording, so please do not be confused by references to the dates here. Next, I will be speaking to Alexander Knent, who's director of the Disarmament, Arms Control and Non-Proliferation Department at the Austrian Ministry of Foreign Affairs, about a new treaty on nuclear disarmament, the Treaty on the, on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. The TPNW entered into force this January, and Alexander has been designated president of the first meeting of states parties to the TPNW, which will take place in January next year in Vienna. And finally, we have an interview of Richard Lennon with Daniel Fix, who is head of the implementation support unit of the Biological Weapons Convention. They discuss multilateral efforts to control biological weapons and the role of the Biological Weapons Convention and how this important treaty relates to its partner, Treaty, the Chemical Weapons Convention. So the full agenda for this module, let's get started. Johan, thank you very much for joining us. Let's talk about the NPT. I want to start with something of a cliche. Uh, the NPT is often referred to as the cornerstone of nuclear non-proliferation and disarmament. What, why is that? Why does everyone refer to it as the cornerstone? Let's start with the international non-proliferation regime being a network of multilateral treaties, regional agreements, international organizations, and informal arrangements and initiatives. And at the core of it all is the Treaty on the Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons, the NPT. And it is a foundational instrument for the regime and therefore is often referred to as the cornerstone of the international non-proliferation regime. Um, the treaty defines um, nuclear and non-nuclear weapon states and their basic obligations with regard to preventing the spread of nuclear weapons and achieving a world without nuclear weapons. And while it does not cover every aspect, uh, every relevant aspect, the treaty contains um, aspirations for and promise of further measures and agreements on nuclear testing, on security assurances and nuclear disarmament. So could you take us through these provisions? What, what are the main provisions of the treaty? What, what does it uh, require of the state's parties? It is indeed a quite concise treaty, uh, but the core non-proliferation obligations are set out in Articles 1, 2 and 3. Uh, and there are different commitments for nuclear and non-nuclear weapon states. So the treaty as those that had manufactured and tested a nuclear explosive device by January 1, 1967. Um, everyone else, by definition, is a non-nuclear weapon state, even if they do happen to acquire nuclear weapons sometime down the road. So Article 1 of the NPT commits nuclear weapon states not to transfer nuclear weapons to any recipient whatsoever and not to assist or encourage any non-nuclear weapon state to acquire um, or manufacture a nuclear uh, weapon. Under Article 2, non-nuclear weapon states commit not to manufacture, acquire, or control nuclear weapons, or receive the transfer of nuclear weapons from anyone, and not to seek or receive assistance in the manufacture of nuclear weapons. Uh, to verify compliance with uh, those non-proliferation obligations, non-nuclear weapon states agree to adopt safeguards on all nuclear materials in all peaceful nuclear activities on their territory or under their jurisdiction. Uh, states do so by concluding safeguards agreements with the International Atomic Energy Agency. Furthermore, all states commit not to provide nuclear materials and technology to um, non-nuclear weapon states that are not subject to safeguards. And that's Article 3 of the NPT. Um, there was a lot of concern at the time of the negotiations that by foregoing a nuclear weapon option, 
non-nuclear weapon states would also miss out on the peaceful uses of the atom, uh, which is why Article 4 of the NPT specifically acknowledges um, the inalienable right of states, parties to pursue uh, peaceful uses of nuclear energy, as long as that right is exercised in accordance with Article 1 and 2 of the NPT. And there is furthermore a pledge to provide assistance to um, uh, states, especially uh, taking into consideration the needs of developing countries in peaceful uses of the atom. That's Article 4. Stopping the spread of nuclear weapons to uh, new countries was not the only concern of the NPT negotiators. Non-nuclear weapon states also wanted concrete commitments on nuclear disarmament. Ultimately, they were not able to include specific measures such as caps on arsenals or prohibition of nuclear testing in the treaty. Uh, however, Article 6 of the NPT does commit all states' parties, nuclear and non-nuclear weapon states, to pursue good faith negotiations on effective measures um, towards uh, stopping the nuclear arms race, achieving nuclear disarmament, and eventually uh, concluding a treaty on general and complete disarmament. These are, I think, the main uh, provisions of the NPT. There are others having to do with the right of withdrawal from the treaty, the right of states parties to get together and create regional nuclear weapon free zones, an article regulating the review of the treaty's implementation, um, and also provisions on amendments and, 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 and other issues. Right. Um, but those, those articles you went through in some detail, in fact, represent what they call the three pillars of the NPT. Is that right? Another sort of buzz uh, expression that, that everybody uh, hears when, when people talk about the NPT. You mentioned safeguards. W what exactly are safeguards and how does the NPT fit together with the International Atomic Energy Agency? Safeguards are a set of technical measures designed to verify that nuclear material and technology remain in peaceful uses and are not diverted to the production of nuclear weapons. The international body that implements nuclear safeguards is the International Atomic Energy Agency, or the IEA. It is an independent organization with its own statute, secretariat, and governing bodies. The IEA predates the NPT and have been implementing nuclear safeguards for a decade by the time the treaty was concluded. So instead of creating a whole new organization, uh, Article 3 of the NPT designates the IEA as the implementing agency for verifying non-proliferation obligations. Before the NPT, the IEA applied safeguards to specific facilities, uh, but to do what the NPT asked it to do and apply safeguards to all nuclear material in a given state, the agency had to develop comprehensive safeguards. Uh, also known as full-scope safeguards. Non-nuclear weapon states party to the NPT are therefore required to conclude a comprehensive safeguards agreement with the IEA. In the 1990s, the agency also implemented a program to strengthen safeguards and adopted model additional protocol. Uh, this protocol is additional to the comprehensive safeguards agreement and provides the IEA with additional tools and access to verify the absence of undeclared nuclear material and activities in a given state. Uh, many states now believe that the additional protocol should be considered part of the requirement uh, of Article 3 of the NPT, uh, but not everyone agrees. Yes, it's an interesting point, in fact, that safeguards and the IEA actually predate the, the NPT by, by some time. Let's uh, talk now about membership. The NPT is a very well-subscribed treaty. Its membership uh, is almost universal. I, I don't know the exact number, but there's a very small number of states that have not joined the NPT. Can you tell us a little bit about those states? Uh, why haven't they joined? And is there any hope that they will? Currently, only five states are not party to the NPT, and four of them possess or are believed to possess nuclear weapons. The fifth state is South Sudan. It's the newest independent state in the system. Uh, it is not nuclear armed and hopefully will join the treaty soon enough. Uh, matters are a lot more complicated with the other four, and these are India, Israel, Pakistan, and North Korea. Um, India's opposition to the treaty began with the criticism of um, it establishing a, an unfair discriminatory system of nuclear haves and have-nots. India actually participated in the negotiation of the NPT but opposed the final text for, for these purposes. 
um, and it wasn't alone in its opposition on these grounds. Eventually, India um, developed its own nuclear weapons, uh, and because it cannot join the treaty as a nuclear weapon state by, by definition, there is um, really no incentive right now for India to join, to join the NPT required to, to, to disarm. Now, Pakistan is in a similar situation and it has nuclear weapons. It cannot be a nuclear weapon state under the NPT uh, and is not likely to move on nuclear disarmament, at least until India does. And even then, it's sort of not a, not a guarantee. Israel is part of a complicated equation in the Middle East and it cites uh, the regional security situation and lack of trust in other countries in the region as reasons not to join the NPT. Uh, Israel, of course, does not um, confirm or deny possessing nuclear weapons and, and has a uh, very opaque stance on its, uh, on its nuclear status. Uh, the DPRK, North Korea, is also a special case unto itself. Uh, it is the only state that used to be a party to the NPT and uh, used the right of withdrawal. Uh, there's been a lot of controversy about whether or not they did so in a proper fashion. Um, importantly, North Korea, while being a party to the NPT, was never in compliance with its non-proliferation obligations. And so um, there is a strong opinion among states parties that North Korea should still be held accountable for, for violations of its safeguards, com uh, commitments, and commitments not to pursue nuclear weapons, even though it is it has officially withdrawn from the NPT. Um, to put it shorter, all of the four countries that have nuclear weapons uh, and, are, and are outside the NPT clearly have decided for one reason or another that they absolutely have to have nuclear weapons. Um, and it doesn't seem likely that the, their mind will be changed in the foreseeable future. Now, just while we're on membership, what about the nuclear weapon states, the five nuclear weapon states parties to the NPT? Did they all join at the beginning or did, did some of them come into the treaty later on? Well, the, uh, of the five, states recognized and uh, defined as nuclear weapon states in the NPT. Um, only three joined from the very beginning and are indeed the depositories uh, of the treaty. These are United States, United Kingdom, and Russia, formerly the Soviet Union. Um, People's Republic of China did not participate in the negotiations uh, and did not join the treaty until 1992 uh, despite being defined as a nuclear weapon state in the treaty. Um, France, uh, that also fits the definition of a nuclear weapon state under the NPT, uh, did not join until 1992. Right, well, we've covered the basics, um, the provisions of the treaty and so on. Let's turn now to perhaps what will interest uh, most of our participants, and that is the NPT review process. Can you tell us about the, the review process and how, how it has evolved over the history of the treaty? In accordance with Article 8 of the NPT, every five years, states parties convene for a review conference. A review conference are supposed to review and assess the implementation of the treaty, as well as decisions of past conferences. Um, in 1995, at the Review and Extension Conference, states parties agreed that um, conferences should not only examine the past, uh, but also set a forward-looking agenda. Uh, so along with reviewing the implementation of the treaty, review conferences need to agree on next steps and measures for states to, to implement. So that's been the, the evolution of, of the, the purpose of the review process uh, over time. Structurally, uh, also in 1995, states agreed um, on a sort of set formula that we, we've been following ever since, that um, review conference is preceded by three meetings of the preparatory committee in each of the three years preceding preceding the review conference. And then we have sort of a, a gap year there. Um, there is in principle an option to uh, have a fourth PREPCOM, but that has never happened before. Um, ideally, the review conference adopts by consensus an outcome document containing both the review of implementation and a forward-looking program of action. Uh, in practice, only about half of the review conferences to date have been able to agree on a final document. The review conference um, typically lasts four weeks, uh, takes place usually in New York, though in the past it also took place in, in Geneva. Um, and the, the organization of, of the time and work is um, 
in such that it begins with a general debate where state parties set out their positions overall on all the relevant issues and of implementation of the treaty and its future. Um, and then work is delegated to three main committees. Main Committee one that deals with nuclear disarmament, Main Committee two that deals with non-proliferation and regional issues, and Main Committee three that deals with peaceful uses and other issues. And since um, the 2000 review conference, it's also been a custom to establish subsidiary bodies under each of the main committees to deal with a particular specific issue. For example, uh, under the main committee one, subsidiary body one usually focuses on the forward-looking action on disarmament. Um, subsidiary body two under main committee two usually focuses on uh, the issue of the Middle East and, and other regional issues. And then under main committee three, subsidiary body three has in the past focused on uh, questions as, uh, such as uh, strengthening, further strengthening the review of the treaty, improving its um, effectiveness of the process, um, and also questions of how to respond to the cases of withdrawal from the NPT. Once the main committees uh, conclude their work, or simply run out of time, uh, they forward their documents, and, uh, ideally agreed by consensus reports to the president of the conference, who then uh, works to put all the pieces together and present a final document for states parties to to either negotiate further or or agree as it. That's that's the structure roughly of the review conference. So over the fifty years now that we've been having these review conferences and and working through this review process, what are the principal agreements and commitments that have been been made in the course of that work? I think the outcomes of three review conferences are of particular significance. Um, it is the 1995 Review and Extension Conference and then 2000 and 2010 Review Conferences. Um, one of the provisions of the NPT states that the treaty should, um, should be enforced initially for 25 years and at the end of that 25 year period, states parties have to decide whether to extend the treaty indefinitely or by some set amount of, of time. So 1995 was the time when that decision had to be made. So perhaps the most important decision in all of the NPT review process history was in 1995, where states agreed that yes, the treaty will continue in force indefinitely. Um, along with that decision, they also adopted a decision on strengthening the review process and the decision on principles and objectives for nuclear disarmament and non-proliferation. Uh, the final part of that package was a resolution um, on establishment of a zone free of nuclear weapons and all other weapons of mass destruction in the Middle East. The 2000 Review Conference adopted a comprehensive consensus final document, which, among other things, contained 13 practical steps for nuclear disarmament. And that is the set of um, decisions that is very often referenced in, in the subsequent review conferences and other review process meetings. In 2010, states parties were successful in adopting a 64 item action plan on nuclear disarmament, non proliferation, and peaceful uses, as well as a set of recommendations for the implementation of the 1995 resolution on the Middle East. So these um, decisions of these three conferences form something that diplomats like calling the NPT a key. They, they are, their implementation is reviewed along with the implementation of the treaty itself um, in the subsequent review conferences. Now you've talked about the 1995 uh, extension, review and extension conference and the role the Middle East played in that, but why is the Middle East such a contentious issue uh, in the NPT? It comes up all the time and I think for a number of, of, of people, including myself, it's a bit of a mystery why the Middle East is, is so important to this treaty. 1995, one of the states whose support for extension was key was Egypt. Um, and Egypt's price for, for support, or at least not blocking the decision on indefinite extension, was uh, addressing the question of, of Israel, um, and Israel having nuclear weapons and not being party to the NPT. So after negotiating with the United States um, in particular, but also Russia and the United Kingdom, uh, they reached an agreement that the three depositories of the NPT, uh, UK, US, and Russia, will sponsor, co-sponsor a resolution 
sort of proclaiming the goal of establishing uh, a zone free of nuclear and other weapons of mass destruction uh, in the Middle East, which, which places a specific, um, a particular responsibility on them to pursue that, that goal, but it also calls for all other states to, to exert effort in this regard. And so Egypt and other Middle Eastern countries view the resolution as, as an essential part of that package of decisions that allowed the treaty to be extended indefinitely. And many countries around the world support that view. Um, the, the issue with the Middle East resolution is that it didn't contain any uh, specific actionable provisions. So what was necessary was uh, to have some kind of plan for implementation, which, which didn't materialize at least until 2010. So 2010 was the first time that the review conference adopted um, more specific steps to be implemented to support the creation of a zone free of nuclear weapons and other WMD in the Middle East. And so every time um, that review conference gathers to review implementation of uh, the treaty and past decisions, of course, the question of what has been done to implement the resolution of the Middle East uh, comes up. And uh, in most cases, it is a controversial one. And along with nuclear disarmament, it's really seen as a make or break issue for uh, every review conference later. So anybody who arrives sort of fresh into NPT diplomacy, one of the first things they learn is that nobody's happy. Uh, and one of the things that nobody's happy about is the review process. So what are some of the perceived problems with the review process and what are the options or possibilities for, for doing something about those? I think one of the problems with the review process now is that the decision on strengthening the review process has not been fully implemented. Um, it was a, in a, in a sense, it was a great aspiration because one of the provisions and one of the standings in 95 and then clarified in 2000 was that, for example, the preparatory committee meetings will deal not only with procedural issues, but will also take up matters of substance and develop recommendations for the review conference. Um, and the, ideally, the, the third PREPCOM should adopt by consensus recommendations for the review conference that can then be forwarded to the conference president. Um, in practice, that has never happened. And, and states um, want to keep their powder dry. It's understandable. They don't want to engage in, in, in negotiations and adopt things by consensus uh, before the time for the actual review conference comes. Um, the, the result of it is that we have a set of three meetings that is, that is two weeks long each. Um, and, and in the end, it's very hard to explain what's been achieved uh, in these meetings other than um, procedural decisions. So that's, um, that's the reason why a lot of countries and, and experts have raised the question of whether we can use that time during the prep comms more effectively. Um, maybe it would be possible to have each prep comm focus on a specific area or specific pillar of the NPT. Uh, the first PREPCOM, for example, focusing on non-proliferation issues because it's taking place in Vienna, this is where the RVA is based, um, etc. Or, or have the sec and have the second PREPCOM focus on disarmament issues because it's taking place in, in Geneva. Um, but the pushback is that states want to discuss all issues and maintain balance at every meeting uh, of the review process, so it, it didn't seem feasible to just designate specific issues to, to specific PREPCOMs. Um, another issue is that the NPT does not have its own dedicated organization. The uh, United Nations Office for Disarmament Affairs serves as a secretariat, but UNODA has a very broad mandate, a lot of other issues on their plate, so they can't dedicate themselves entirely to, to the NPT. And so there have been suggestions um, at previous review conferences to establish a dedicated secretariat within UNODA, so designate a person working only with only on, uh, on the NPT. Um, I think the opposition to that was more political than, 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 than pragmatic, and um, the issue, the, the, the proposal was not, was not successful. Furthermore, we, um, again, because states do tend to not want to adopt uh, consensus documents at the prep comms, basically we have in-depth discussion and negotiation of, on the treaty implementation every five years. 
Um, some other treaties and conventions have annual, uh, the annual meetings of state parties, uh, and that allows for sort of more continuity, keeping, um, keeping a finger on the pulse better. Uh, some, uh, some proposals in the past have addressed that question of whether we should have more frequent meetings that have, uh, that would adopt uh, uh, documents and decisions. That, that also didn't go very far. And in general, the pushback has been that it's not a procedural problem. The fact that in the review conferences uh, so often fail to adopt uh, documents is not the problem of the process itself and its organization. It's really the matter of, of political will. We've looked at the review process then, uh, and of course we have a review conference coming up. The 10th review conference, which was supposed to be held in April and May of this year, it was uh, among the many victims of the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, it has been postponed. Perhaps it will take place in January 2021, perhaps later in the year. Uh, but let's talk a bit now about what's going to happen at that review conference and why it's important. So what, what are the main issues confronting states parties at this 10th review conference? Start by saying that progress on nuclear disarmament has been a central issue to every NPT review conference since the treaty um, entered into force. And that is understandable because that was this, the, the most aspirational provision that you know, the treaty lacks any specifics in terms of measures, in terms of uh, timelines, implementing organizations. Um, and so in part, the NPT review process itself was meant to increase accountability. To, to give non-nuclear weapon states in particular a way to um, sort of hold the nuclear weapon states' feet to the fire and periodically ask for um, progress uh, on nuclear disarmament in particular. Um, and so the next review conference will not be different in that regard. I would expect nuclear disarmament to be central, all the more because of the, the terrible situation we find ourselves in, um, in terms of the state of the nuclear arms control architecture and, and the crisis of relations between some of the nuclear weapon states and complete lack of trust. And, and, and that, that I think will be a central topic at the next review conference. Um, the Middle East, which as I said, usually tends to be uh, contentious, uh, may or may not be central next time. It in part depends on uh, the progress of the, uh, the new process that was established uh, in the UN General Assembly of annual conferences on the Middle East uh, nuclear weapon-free zone. Um, so depending on how that goes and how uh, some of the nuclear weapon states in particular react to it, uh, will define whether or not the, treat, you know, the question of the Middle East is controversial as it, as it usually is at the 10th review conference. The situation with Iran and, and um, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, um, I think also be, would be uh, quite central to the discussions at the review conference. Uh, and another issue that's, that's really been gaining traction, uh, more so than in previous review cycles, is the, peaceful, the role of peaceful uses of the atom and, and how the NPT can better support peaceful uses and better promote peaceful uses. This is the province of the IEA. It's part of the IEA mandate to promote and provide assistance in peaceful uses. But because the um, NPT has peaceful uses as one of its three pillars, uh, there's been a feeling among some state parties at least that, that more could be done in this regard and that not enough attention has been paid to the question of peaceful uses in previous review conferences. My next question, which is about the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, the TPNW. Uh, this is quite a controversial treaty. How, how will the TPNW affect the review conference? I think there's now 40 states have ratified that treaty, which means there are 10 more needed for entry into force. There's a reasonable chance, I suppose, that the TPNW might be in force at the time of the review conference, or perhaps shortly afterwards. Uh, how is that going to play out uh, in the review conference itself? The Facebook relationship status for the two treaties would be, it's complicated. Um, if you recall, Article 6 of the NPT um, commits states parties to pursue negotiations on effective measures towards, among other things, nuclear disarmament. And the, the states that advocated and led the negotiations 
of, of the TPNW have framed that as, as part of the implementation of Article 6. These are the negotiations to um, create measures, to adopt measures uh, advancing nuclear disarmament. And in that sense, the TPNW is directly related to the NPT. It is, it is um, a new entrant to the non-proliferation regime. It's, it's part of this, of this system. And it specifically acknowledges the NPT and its preamble. Of course, that's not the uh, opinion that's, that's shared by everybody, especially in nuclear weapon states, who have um, argued that the TPNW undermines the NPT. I don't see it as undermining the NPT in any sort of legal sense, uh, but it does complicate matters uh, politically. It's hard to ignore treaty, especially if it enter enters into force by the time of the next review conference, that prohibits possession of, of nuclear weapons. Um, and so the challenge at the next review conference uh, would be to, to find a language acknowledging the very existence of, of the TPNW in a way that will satisfy both the opponents and supporters of the treaty. Um, I do hope it doesn't become the central disagreement. And my understanding is that uh, states supporting the TPNW um, don't want it to become the central issue. To them, the treaty is a reality. It is, it is there, and, and there is no, no reason to sort of litigate whether or not it has a right to exist at the review conference. Uh, what they would like to focus on is the implementation of decisions of past NPT review conferences. So I think it, it's a challenge for both sides to, to, find, to find a way to agree to disagree in a sense on, on the treaty, at least for the, for the purpose of the next review conference, um, and, and not make that a, a, a central com uh, controversial subject because it's, it's, it's a really not productive use, use of time. Well, we've talked about the bad news, the challenges. Let's look uh, at the more positive side now. What are the most promising areas for progress or agreement at, at the review conference? One of the um, central issues that emerged during this review cycle and is likely to, to be quite prominent at the review conference is the status of past commitments. Not everyone apparently agrees that they uh, constitute a part of NPT a key and that they are binding in any, in any way. Um, and so that, that is very troubling for states parties who in good faith adopt um, consensus documents containing those uh, decisions, those next steps, fully expecting them to be implemented. Um, and so one of the positive developments I think recently has been this, this greater unity among states' parties in, in reaffirming the validity of, of past commitments and insisting that there ought to be a way to not only um, reaffirm our support for them, uh, but also build on them. And one thing that the review conference should focus on is, is uh, developing perhaps more specific targets, benchmarks um, for or st steps that they identify as priorities deriving from the past, past decisions, including the 2010 action plan, but they also could revisit the 2000 uh, practical steps and, and, and all the way back to the 1995 principles and objectives. I think there is a possibility that states uh, focus on this between now and the review conference and come up with, with uh, concrete proposals on how to take, for, take forward uh, past commitments. What about um, nuclear risk reduction? There's been quite a lot of discussion and, and, and proposals put forward on, on risk reduction. What's your view of that? Um, on nuclear risk reduction. Uh, nuclear risk reduction has become a uh, kind of a buzz topic in the past review cycle. Um, the reasons for it are not very encouraging because it's, it's really the growing perception of, of, a, of an increased uh, risk of use of nuclear weapons. So the, the uh, proliferation of studies and conversations on nuclear risk reduction is a response to, to people being worried that the, the threshold to, to using nuclear weapons is, is being lowered. Um, at the same time, it, it has raised some very interesting um, issues and, and thus possibly open some um, opportunities for further steps uh, at the next review conference. 
but as far as I know, there's very little agreement on, on nuclear risk reduction measures among the nuclear weapon states themselves. But to the extent that the review conference can push them to work on this issue um, further, I think, I think that would be a useful development. Finally, what new proposals or ideas or collaborations have been put forward so far? The, the review conference was supposed to be held uh, in April, so I, I, I'm presuming that a lot of ideas were already quite well developed. Well, what's out there? In the run-up to the 2020 NPT review conference, we saw the emergence of at least one new international initiative uh, trying to identify steps that, that most of the member states' parties could agree on and, and adopt at the review conference. Um, it's called the Stepping Stones, and it's, it was spearheaded by uh, Sweden. Uh, and it's, um, it's had a couple of ministerial meetings now, and they continue their preparations, uh, I understand, for, for the 10th and PT Review Conference. They bring together uh, more sort of the moderate middle power states in an attempt to identify the areas um, where, where progress is, is most likely, where agreement is, is most likely. That's perhaps the most significant development as far as cross-regional groupings in, in the NPT go. Um, in terms of the issues themselves, um, nuclear risk reduction has certainly been uh, at the top of the agenda for, for, many, for many states. Um, and one of the challenges for the review conference and particularly for nuclear weapon state is to reaffirm uh, that a nuclear war not be won and should never be fought. I think it is it is fundamental to provide the assurance that, that states are not not heading not, not not envisioning the use of nuclear weapons lightly, um, and and that and that offers an opportunity for for the next review conference. Well, thank you very much, Goha, for for joining us and and sharing your impressions and your assessments. to welcome now Alexander Kment, who is Director of the Disarmament, Arms Control and Non-Proliferation Department at the Austrian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And Alexander has also been designated President of the first meeting of States Parties of the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. Congratulations, first of all, for that uh, designation. Um, well deserved, one uh, might say. Um, the TPNW is a new treaty negotiated in 2017. It entered into force on the 22nd of January this year. And you have been very much involved in this treaty from the very early days of discussions from the outset when this uh, idea uh, was born. Um, the TPNW in many ways is a new type of multilateral nuclear disarmament treaty. And um, can you explain maybe briefly um, the origins of the treaty and why it is different and why from your perspective it's so important? Thank you very much uh, for inviting me and for giving me this opportunity. Yes, the TPNW entered into force uh, just a few months ago. It originates uh, from the humanitarian initiative uh, when about 10, 11 years ago, a growing number of states started to look at nuclear weapons uh, through the humanitarian lens, um, uh, trying to change the way we talk about nuclear weapons, not as a, uh, not merely from a security policy perspective, uh, uh, as, as, um, as a guarantor of international stability, but rather from the perspective of what would happen if, uh, if nuclear weapons were to be used or would explode. So you look at the consequences of these weapons, which are terrible and even greater than previously understood, and you also look at the risks of something going wrong. And both aspects together um, challenge the notion of nuclear weapons as a basis of security. So over several years, uh, several conferences took place. Many studies were, uh, uh, were published uh, looking at these aspects and more and more states came to the conclusion that a prohibition, a clear, 
unequivocal legal prohibition of nuclear weapons, something that did not exist before, would be necessary uh, as a key effective measure towards a world without nuclear weapons. And also um, setting a norm essentially is uh, the one step that nuclear weapon states uh, uh, were able to do without necessarily the participation of everybody. Because of course, uh, uh, the actual elimination of these weapons requires the participation of countries that have them. So it's a norm setting approach based on an understanding uh, of the humanitarian consequences of these weapons and the uh, risks uh, that come with uh, this weapon. Um, I think that's a very important aspect, understanding the transboundary dimension of those weapons. Um, so um, it's uh, it's different in the sense that it that it that it sets a norm um, without the participation of all states, uh, but it is important because it closes a, a legal gap that existed before. And of course, it's a work in progress. It's a young treaty. It only has a small number of uh, states parties so far, but uh, it's a working process. So this is why I would say it's very important. Thanks very much. Um... You said it's work in progress and an important milestone will be the first meeting of states parties, which will take place from the 12th to the 14th of January in Vienna. You will chair this meeting. Can you briefly outline to us what states parties will have to decide on during that meeting? Maybe also very briefly, whether there are things that you hope that will be decided and discussed at um, this meeting, particularly with regard to implementing this treaty. Um, there are also some um, new positive obligations placed on states parties. If you could just briefly paint to us the picture of what will happen in Vienna in January, that would be very useful. Yes, thank you. There are, of course, some sort of housekeeping things that need to be done, some tasks that have been specifically given to the first meeting of states parties. We have to agree on rules of procedure. We have to decide uh, on uh, uh, deadlines uh, that are formulated in Article 4 of the treaty, deadlines for the elimination of nuclear weapons and deadline for the removal of nuclear weapons from countries that host these weapons. These are, these are uh, aspects that were left in the negotiations for the first meeting of states parties. So that is something that uh, needs to be done. But then you mentioned positive obligations, and that is definitely a uh, unique uh, feature uh, of the TPNW in the nuclear weapons field. Uh, uh, the treaty contains very clear provisions on victim assistance and environmental remediation and cooperation and, and assistance. So again, that is something that states parties can look at and implement uh, uh, on their own without the participation uh, of, of, uh, of countries that have these weapons to, uh, to, um, uh, to find ways to assist uh, victims of past use of nuclear weapons uh, and testing of nuclear weapons to define uh, standards uh, to, uh, to work on the uh, to work on the implementation uh, of, of, uh, of these aspects. Then, of course, another dimension is universalization, which is in Article 12 of the treaty, which is an obligation for states parties to work towards the universalization. So universalization in a broad sense means to, uh, to promote the norms that are contained in the treaty. And of course, they are uh, essentially the prohibition norms, uh, but also the positive obligations and the humanitarian and risk uh, underlying rationale of the TPNW. So we expect uh, uh, strong uh, political messages uh, uh, on these aspects to come out of this treaty. In the consultation so far, and uh, just one sentence on that, uh, um, they have gone very well. There's a very strong common sense of purpose and states parties want to demonstrate that they are very serious about implementing this treaty and and to prepare the first meeting of states parties in a in a in a diligent way and of course we also hope and we will 
uh, encourage uh, countries that are currently skeptical of the TPNW to participate as observers. Uh, uh, so they will certainly be welcomed in Vienna. If you were to think ahead, let's say 10 years into the future, um, 2030, where would you like to see the TPNW and where particularly would you like to see it in relation to the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty? I have always argued, and uh, all the other member states of the TPNW have argued that the TPNW is an expression, is a complement to the to the NPT. It is an effective measure to implement Article Six, and it is an effective measure to implement Action One of the 2010 Action Plan that says that all states parties have to pursue policies that are compatible with a, to achieve a world without nuclear weapons. So uh, I firmly reject the notion that there is any contradiction between the TPNW and the NPT. Uh, quite the opposite. Uh, it gives strength to the NPT, it returns credibility to the NPT, and it also underlines the non-proliferation dimension of the NPT. So that's the first thing that I wanted to say. Um, for the future, I hope that uh, we will get many more states parties uh, to sign up to the TPNW. And I'm realistic in the sense that there will probably be several states uh, that will remain outside of the TPNW. However, what I really hope is that what I said before is that the arguments on which the TPNW is based are getting much, much more into the public uh, discourse and that we have a much broader societal dialogue about uh, uh, these weapons and all the com all the complexities that come uh, with these weapons and the risks and the consequences. So um, even if states do not sign up to the TPNW, if the TPNW triggers a much, much broader, much more honest and much more inclusive discussion about uh, nuclear weapons and the sustainability of a security system based on nuclear deterrence, then I think the TPNW uh, is achieving and has achieved its transformational potential because it brings in this different type of discourse that has been, that has been suppressed for a long time. Daniel Feeks, who's Chief of the Biological Weapons Convention Implementation Support Unit at the Office for Disarmament Affairs here in Geneva. And Daniel's very kindly agreed to tell us a bit about the Biological we Weapons Convention, which we're going to call the BWC because uh, it's easier for everyone. To kick off, Daniel, if you can just tell us a bit about the treaty, how and why it was created and what its main provisions are. Okay, thanks Richard. Um, so yeah, the BWC, like you said, the Biological Weapons Convention, is a, it's a disarmament treaty negotiated between states. So it was negotiated in the late 1960s, early 1970s, over a fairly short period of time, really. And its main purpose, obviously, is to prohibit completely the development, production, and basically the use of biological weapons. So to prevent disease being used as a weapon. Um, it's, as I mentioned, a treaty between states. Its main provisions, as I mentioned, is really a disarmament convention, but it also has provisions relating to um, assistance to countries in case they're attacked with biological weapons. It has some provisions for investigating any allegations of the use of biological weapons and their development, and also provisions relating to international cooperation and assistance as well, and promoting the peaceful uses of biology. So it's, as I said, at, at heart, it's a disarmament convention, but beyond that, it's got other provisions as well relating to the, the aspects that I just mentioned as well. So it's been around for a while, as you said, negotiated, uh, well, concluded in the early 70s. Um, we've had time to see how, how it works. What would you say are the, the main strengths and weaknesses of it as a, as a multilateral treaty? I think one of the main strengths of the convention is the, the kind of universal norm that it now codifies against the use of disease as a weapon. I mean, it's you know been long the case, I think, even before the BWC, I mean, even stretching back some people say even stretching back centuries and across different cultures that there's been this kind of aversion um, to the use of disease as a weapon. You know, I think us as human beings, we're kind of really repelled by the idea of people using disease 
as, as a weapon, disease to inflict harm um, on people, on even on animals and crops as well. So this idea of using um, disease as a weapon has long been seen as being kind of sinister, as being particularly repugnant. And the Biological Weapons Convention really codifies that norm in its preamble, in fact. It says that the use of biological weapons would be repugnant to the conscience of mankind. Um, so it really gets that idea across. It, it codifies that norm. And, and nowadays it also is, you know, that norm is pretty much universal. We have 183 um, states parties now to the Biological Weapons Convention, so not fully universal yet. There are 14 countries still outside of the convention that we're, you know, regularly working with and encouraging them to also join the convention, and many have done so over the last um, few years. So I think that's one of the main strengths of the convention is it really kind of codifies that long-standing norm against the use of biological weapons um, and it's as i mentioned now quite widely um, universal as well in terms of you know the the other side of the coin some weaknesses you mentioned already and it's it's a fairly old convention it's been around this year in fact marked the 45th anniversary of the entry into force of the convention so it has been around for a while um, it was negotiated at a time when it wasn't possible for, for the drafters to agree on any kind of stringent verification system or any um, elaborate institutional framework for the convention. So it lacks those things, unlike, for example, the more recent Chemical Weapons Convention, which has an institution behind it and a, a verification system. Um, so people often say that the BWC is, is institutionally weak. It doesn't have a big institution. You know, the, the institution it has is us, this implementation support unit here in Geneva, just three people, um, based within the Office for Disarmament Affairs, and in a series of annual um, expert and political meetings, and then every five years review conferences as well. So, you know, it, it's not an operational convention in the sense of, for example, something like the Chemical Weapons Convention. So I think people recognize that as, as one of the main um, drawbacks of the convention, and it's something that ever since its entry into force, um, states parties have been trying in different ways um, to rectify as well. Right. You mentioned the review conferences. Uh, like other treaties, the BWC has a review conference every five years. Uh, could you take us through some of the, the, the key decisions and agreements that have been taken by those conferences over the nearly 50-year history of the, of the Convention? Um, yeah, sure. So like you said, like many other disarmament um, treaties, there are these five yearly review conferences. Um, the main purpose of BWC review conferences, again, like, like others as well, is to review the operation of the convention, so really kind of looking backwards over the previous five years, um, but also looking forwards as well, to, and particularly in the case of the BWC, because it lacks this kind of permanent machinery, it's really each review conference decides what will happen in, in the next five-year period as well before the, um, the subsequent review conference. Um, so, you know, th those two factors, the, the backwards looking, the kind of retrospective is, is obviously important, but also the forward looking aspects is important as well. And in regards to the forward looking, it's also um, specifically mentioned in the convention that the review conferences should also take account of developments in science and technology. So those aspects are, are obviously particularly important as well. Um, previous review conferences, obviously we've had eight of them so far. The most recent was in 2016. Uh, the next one, the ninth review conference, is, is pretty close now. It's coming up um, next year in 2021. Um, and because of the way the BWC was negotiated, the fact that it's a fairly short convention, it's really more in, in principle rather than in detail, much of the subsequent evolution of the convention has actually been done via the review conferences. So yeah, so one of the things that the second review conference in 1986 um, agreed on was a system of so-called confidence building measures, annual reports that states parties have to submit in which they declare relevant activities, relevant facilities on their territory. That was first agreed in 1986 and then subsequently elaborated at other review conferences. Um, review conferences have also agreed a more detailed and more elaborated procedure for dealing with um, compliance concerns under the convention as well. That again started with the second review conference and was elaborated further by other review conferences as well. And then in the mid-1990s, it was the review conferences that established a process that was negotiated or that led to negotiations on a legally binding instrument to strength, comprehensively strengthen the Biological Weapons Convention as well. That was a process that established what's called an, an ad hoc group 
um, that negotiated a, a draft protocol to the convention. So the review conferences are really the, the, the kind of engine um, that, that pushes along the evolution of the Biological Weapons Convention. And more recently, in 2006, the sixth review conference established the implementation support unit, so our, our small team working here in the office in Geneva, um, and also review conferences in, in the 2000s have established and then renewed this process of annual meetings that we're currently um, working on now, so annual meetings of experts and meetings of states parties. Uh, you mentioned the review conference uh, establishing the implementation support unit in 2006. Could you tell us a bit more about the ISU and how it's structured and its function and uh, how it's funded? Um, sure, yeah. So, as I mentioned, 2006, the sixth review conference was a particularly um, important review conference because it, it established many things and many of the, um, the methods and the institutions that we're still working with today as well. So, it established what we call this intercessional program, various meetings of experts and a meeting of states parties every year. And as, as you just mentioned, it established this implementation um, support unit. Previously, the BWC had been supported via um, kind of temporary staff and temporary resources from within the Office for Disarmament Affairs. But many states parties felt that the BWC needed more, um, more permanent, in a way, um, institutional support. So it was agreed in 2006 to establish this implementation support unit based within um, the Office for Disarmament Affairs here in Geneva. It was also agreed that it should be a fairly small unit. The sixth review conference said it should be three people based within the Office for Disarmament Affairs, and that's, that's the way it is at the moment as well. It's, it's a small team, and it's got a, a fairly limited mandate as well. It's not, as I mentioned before, there's no kind of operational mandate for the implementation support unit. So one of the key jobs is to obviously service the meetings of states parties that take place here in Geneva and the review conferences when they happen. So we act as a secretariat to those, those meetings when they take place. We also act as a, a kind of facilitator and as a, as a clearing house for information to be passed to and from states parties. Subsequently, we've also been given additional mandates. So, for example, at the seventh review conference in 2011, we were asked to establish a, an, a database, an assistance and cooperation database. So to actually act as um, a, a facilitator for offers um, and requests for assistance as well. So we've, we've been doing that ever since then as well. Um, we also collate and receive the annual confidence building measure reports that I mentioned and we make sure that those are accessible to all states parties so that they can act as the, um, the transparency measure that they were intended to be. And then as, as our name implies, you know, it's an implementation support unit so we're not purely a, a meeting secretariat or just a, a kind of post box here in Geneva. We do, to the extent that we can and with the resources that we have available, we do try and support implementation of the convention in states parties as well. So where we can, we will you know, um, provide assistance, provide expertise to states parties. We will often go to states parties again with, when resources allow you know, to help and to advise them on implementation of the BWC. And we also work closely with the chairs um, of the annual meetings as well in terms of universalization of the convention. So we actually promote the convention, we talk to states that haven't yet joined the convention and, and encourage them to do so, you know, answer any questions, concerns they may have. We keep in quite close contact with the 14 that haven't yet joined and also with other states parties and also regional organisations as well and try and work, you know, to, to encourage them to join the convention as well. And, and then, as I mentioned, we've got the assistance database that we that we run as well and we keep on filtering and following up and facilitating exchanges of um, offers and requests of assistance between states parties as well. So it's a, it, it's, you know, a, a varied um, mandate that we have, um, but not in the sense of other organisations, not an operational mandate in that sense. But, but how is the ISU funded then? Um, yeah, so the, the ISU, like the rest of the what's called this intercessional program, these um, series of annual meetings that we have. Um, the ISU is also funded from assessed contributions from BWC states parties. So um, every year um, invoices are sent out to, to the states parties um, based on a, a total budget, an, an overall budget that is agreed by states parties. And then each state party is assessed against a particular scale of assessment. So it's basically like the scale of assessments used for the United Nations. 
Um, so, you know, the bigger countries will pay more than the smaller countries, for example. But the overall BWC budget is, is fairly small. Um, currently, it's about 1.5 million um, US dollars per year. That's for the meetings themselves and also for the costs of the implementation support unit. So that's split between the current 183 um, states parties, which means that some, you know, some of the bigger countries will be paying a few hundred thousand US dollars. And then down to the smaller, which some some of the smallest countries only pay ten dollars um, per year as well. So it's like I said, the ISU is funded by all of its states parties because we are here to service um, all of the states parties as well. But the budget is is fairly small and is you know split between the, the states parties in terms of population and size. Uh, you mentioned the uh, confidence building measures mm. as the main transparency mechanism in the BWC. Can you tell us what? I mean, diplomats working in Geneva on BWC issues would need to know about the, the CBMs. Sure. So, I mean, one of the first things that I, I mentioned earlier on that the CBMs were agreed back in 1986. The second review conference agreed that these um, reports, that all states parties should be submitting these reports. Previous, um, sorry, subsequent review conferences have also agreed the same, that these reports should be submitted um, by states parties and resolutions, the, the annual resolution in the General Assembly on the BWC has also calls on all states parties to submit the reports. So one of the first things to say is that these reports, you know, submission of these reports is, is a political obligation for states parties. It's not a legal obligation because it's not actually mentioned in the convention text itself, but it is, as I mentioned, every review conference and General Assembly resolutions have said that these reports should be, should be submitted and it's called on all states parties to submit these reports. So that's, I think, the first thing to say is that these reports are are required. Um, so it's important that they're submitted. Unfortunately, the submission rate has never been particularly high. It's never, in fact, gone above 50%. Um, it's something that we still work on. You know, uh, One of the other things that we do is to try and promote and encourage the submission of these confidence building measures. So it's important, I think, that people know that these, are, these reports should be submitted, but also that there are obviously the fact that the submission rate is quite low means that there are some challenges that states parties face in doing so. Um, so I think it's important for people here to know, you know about some of those challenges that have been much discussed in previous meetings. Um, nationally, you know, many countries have had um, challenges submitting these reports because they require quite a lot of digging around, finding information nationally, quite a lot of interagency work um, back home. So it's not the people here in Geneva that would be doing this work, but it's their experts in capital. But because of the kind of varied information that is required to be submitted in these CBMs, you know, for the purposes of, of transparency and reassurance, it requires quite a lot of coordination back home in capital as well. So, for example, between ministries of foreign affairs, defence, health, environment, um, you know, home ministries of interior, for example, um, and that's obviously quite a challenge sometimes. But it's also you know, rather than looking just as, as a challenge and as the negative aspects to it, it's important, I think, and we've been trying to say this, to look at the positive aspects, because on any of these issues relating to, to biosecurity, and we're seeing it obviously particularly now with the um, COVID-19 pandemic, that response to any of these issues requires a kind of whole of government uh, uh, interagency um, process. So the CBMs can actually be seen as a tool um, to encourage that and to encourage working together and you know this kind of cross-governmental approach on these issues relating relating to biosecurity and obviously by the the authorities in a country knowing you know what relevant activities are taking place on their territory so for example which laboratories are working um, with potentially dangerous agents that that is also a, a good thing for that particular country they obviously have a better idea of where um, dangerous pathogens are being stored, who's working with them, for example. So, you know, having that kind of national inventory, national knowledge is obviously good for the country um, for its own national security as well. So there are various benefits to those. Um, so, you know, it's another, I think, a good thing for the people here in, in Geneva to realise. I mean, it's not that they would be doing so much. Generally, the CBMs are collated back in capital and then often passed to the missions. Yeah, so the missions here in Geneva will be the ones that pass them on to us after having received them from capital. But it, it's good, I think, for them to know um, the details, you know, why these things are important. And obviously, you know, the, the overriding um, purpose of CBMs is to increase transparency and, and reassurance among states' parties. So I think that's, 
you know, that's as well, obviously, you know, almost goes without saying, but it's good to emphasize that as well, that these are meant to be a tool for, um, you know, reassurance among states parties. The CBMs are accessible to all states parties, um, you know, via an electronic platform that we've now, that we've now established as well. So every state party can look at the CBM of every other state party that submits one. Okay, uh, you mentioned the other important uh, thing that the review conferences have set up is this intersessional program of meetings of experts, uh, annual meetings of states parties. Um, can you tell us how that works and in particular what the delegations here need to know to prepare and uh, sure. participate effectively in these meetings? Yeah, so since the early 2000s in fact there have been these meetings of experts taking place every year which are you know, more technical meetings as, as the name implies. We have uh, usually around about 400 or so people attending each of the meetings of experts, um, many here in Geneva, obviously, but also experts coming from capitals, from um, international and regional organizations, and also from um, scientific associations and civil society as well. So these are very you know, big meetings and can be quite broad ranging um, meetings as well. They've evolved over the years in, in the early 2000s and, and up until um, most recently there was kind of one meeting of experts per year that would cover a whole range of different activities. Um, the topics were quite carefully selected and, and quite specific as well, so it wasn't uh, an open agenda for any of these meetings of experts. It was very much a kind of a, a limited and a focused agenda on specific topics. And again, those topics have evolved um, somewhat over the years as well. Most recently, uh, in 2017, the, the process that we're working with now was agreed and that is, uh, again, a further evolution of what has been going on since the early 2000s. And we now, instead of just having one meeting of experts per year, we actually have five separate meetings of experts. They will take place um, back to back, so one after the other at the same time of the year. Um, but rather than one meeting addressing several topics, we have several meetings, one on each of the different topics. So there's currently five meetings of experts that take place. We had in 2018, 2019, obviously the plan um, was that we would have those same five meetings of experts this year. Now, COVID-19 pandemic has, as it has with many, many other intergovernmental meetings, has um, you know, presented a lot of challenges for, for those meetings as well. And there are currently consultations um, going on as to what, you know, what will happen with the meetings of experts this year, which are actually scheduled to start here in Geneva in just a few weeks time. Um, so, so those are the, the technical level meetings, these meetings of experts, they come up with reports. Um, there's also, each meeting will have a, a summary issued by the chair of that meeting. He or she will consult with states, um, states parties about that summary. And then those are forwarded to the, the kind of second type of meeting that happens every year, the meeting of states parties which is more of a political meeting. So the meetings of experts are much more technical, expert level meetings, and then the meeting of states parties, which usually takes place about three months later, um, usually in December every year. It's the more political meeting at which those reports and the technical meetings are considered. And the meeting of states parties will also consider issues relating to the budget of the, of, um, the BWC. Um, and other issues relating to the management of the, the kind of intersessional process as a whole. The MSP is also the opportunity where there's the general debate, so where delegations can make their um, you know, national statements as well. So in, in terms of preparation, particularly for people here in Geneva, the technical meetings generally require quite a lot of coordination with their experts in capital. Many of them will, as I mentioned, actually you know, have delegations, including experts from capital. And those delegations from capital may actually include people from different ministries, from you know, law enforcement, from ministries of health, for example, who people here in Geneva may not be used to so much working with um, before. So we often find that you know, people coming to Geneva may not have met with, um, had much contact before with their delegations here and with the permanent missions because they have a much more um, technical focus back home. So you have these kind of multidisciplinary teams coming here um, so that, that's one issue, I think, is you know, particularly for the meetings of experts, which, which again can get into quite, um, sometimes at least into quite technical details in, in the discussions as well. So it's good for people here to have at least a, a general understanding of those different technical issues. As I mentioned before, the meeting of states parties are much more the traditional 
um, diplomatic meeting with, with general debate and you know negotiation of the report and everything as well. So um, yeah, much more of the traditional style of diplomacy. And then obviously, I mean, we in the implementation support unit, we're the secretariat to all of those meetings, and we're obviously happy to to you know answer questions, to provide any guidance and assistance that people have as well. You know, we're easily easily reachable here as well. Uh, okay, we've talked a lot about review conferences past decisions, but there's another review conference coming up for next year, 2021, the pandemic permitting. Uh, what are the main issues that the states parties will have to deal with at that conference? Okay, yeah, so I, I mentioned already that, you know, review conferences has the kind of dual functions of looking backwards and looking forwards as well, as, as well as in that forwards looking element, looking into issues relating to science and technology as well. So, I mean, one, one thing that the review conference will, is mandated to do is to look backwards. So to look at how the current intercessional program has been running, basically all of the meetings that we've had over the last few years and hopefully this year as well, you know, basically everything that they do contributes towards and is kind of food, food for the review conference next year. So it, it will need to um, decide what to do about everything that has been discussed and, you know, some of the issues raised during um, the previous or by that time the previous three years of meetings so that so that will be one thing so obviously looking at the reports from the meetings of experts um, the discussions at the MSP as well the, the review conference will need to kind of take all of that into account and then you know decide what to do with all of those different different issues that have been raised and some of those you know the issues that will be discussed in that respect are you know the traditional issues that always come up at, at BWC review conferences and in and in discussions of, of the BWC in general. So relating, uh, we talked already about the, the CBMs, the confidence building measures, for example, it's a system that dates back to 1986. It's been revised along the way, but you know, many questions have, have arisen, um, firstly in terms of how many reports are submitted, as I mentioned, the submission rate is quite low, and also whether all the information required is, is still relevant today. So you know, that, that's one issue, that uh, a quite practical issue that could be looked into. There's also issues relating to national implementation, um, to assistance and cooperation. So many kind of traditional issues that will be raised. The review conference generally or traditionally has done a, an article by article review of the BWC and comes up with a, a written article by article review. So each topic is picked up during the course of that article um, by article review. There will be other issues that, that don't get picked up, which relate more to the institutional aspects. So this um, series, as I mentioned, of meetings of experts, meetings of states parties, the way it's been done since or beginning in 2018 has been you know, quite different to the way it was done in the past. So I think there will be quite a lot of reflection on those institutional issues as well as to how, you know, how this new, new style of doing things has, has functioned, whether it's an improvement on you know what, what went before as well. So I think some of those issues will also come up as well. And as I mentioned, there's obviously the, the other issue of looking forwards as well. And you know one of the big parts of that is looking into issues relating to science and technology. We've had a specific um, meeting of experts on science and technology um, that's been meeting 2018, 2019, and will hopefully meet this year. So you know those issues have been well considered issues relating to you know genome editing synthetic biology you know all of these different things that we're hearing about at the moment the advances in science and technology you know which bring many many benefits but also bring with them potential risks as well so that will be you know a very big topic to be discussed and at the review conference and, and particularly how going forwards the BWC and its states parties collectively deal with those um, with those advances in science and technology as well every five years you know, things have changed hugely in the intervening time. So it, it may be that there's, um, you know, uh, uh, different ways of looking at those issues more regularly. We have already annual expert meetings, but perhaps other other mechanisms may also be addressed. And then going forwards, obviously, the implications of the pandemic that we're, you know, we're currently living through at the moment, it's obviously going to be a big issue at the review conference. We saw at the previous review conference in 2016, that the Ebola outbreak that took place in West Africa in 2014, 2015, that played quite a big role, you know, within the BWC, within the discussions. Um, it, it gave quite a lot of um, new kind of impetus to discussions, particularly on Article 7 of the of the convention. 
Um, and so if you know if that happened with the the epidemic that took place in West Africa, I think you know it, it's inevitable that this much bigger pandemic, which has affected every corner of the world, will also um, you know have an impact on the discussions within the BWC as well. And you know that will be seen at the review conference. And then there will be as there as there are every time we have a review conference, every time we have a BWC meetings, discussions on the kind of the future evolution of the convention itself as well. Uh, as, I, as I mentioned before, because the convention itself is, is fairly short, um, you know, a kind of higher level um, convention compared to some others without all of the detail and particularly without any kind of permanent machinery. For example, like the Chemical Weapons Convention has, uh, you know, permanent institutions. The BWC doesn't have that. A lot of what the BWC has has to be discussed, agreed and renewed every five years. So every five years there is a discussion about what should come next and that kind of issue of the, um, the trajectory of the BWC will, will be one of the big issues um, for discussion as, as it always is at every review conference as well. Uh, I'd like to turn now, um, since we have a few minutes, on to chemical weapons. Chemical and biological weapons are often mm. talked about together in the, in the same sentence or we talk about CBW, uh, chemical and biological weapons. Uh, we have the Chemical Weapons Convention, which is based in The Hague. The Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons is, is there. Uh, so what is the relationship between the BWC and the, and the Chemical Weapons Convention, the CWC? Are, are there areas of overlap or, or common concern? Um, yeah, sure. I mean, there are many, many areas of overlap. And I think one of the first, the first things to say is that historically they have, um, you know, these two issues, chemical weapons and biological weapons, have historically been considered together. You mentioned, you know, just now about CBW, you know, chemical and biological warfare. They've they've long been considered, and you know, many years ago, you know, we didn't have the kind of scientific knowledge that we have now, and the distinctions between poisons and disease. So, you know, for a long time historically, these issues were were really lumped together. So, for example, we have something like the 1929 25 Geneva Protocol, which covers both chemical and biological weapons. And even up to the time that the BWC was negotiated, states were considering both of these topics together. You know, here in Geneva, in the um, predecessors to the Conference on Disarmament that meets in the room just behind me, you know, these issues were considered together. And within the General Assembly, there were resolutions on CBW. So they were a long time that the two issues were linked together. In the late 1960s, uh, you know, as, as we've already discussed, we had this um, you know, kind of slightly new approach in some ways that the two issues were separated. It was decided to, and they agreed on the text of the BWC here in, in Geneva. So a convention dealing specifically with biological weapons. But when you look at the, the text of the BWC, there are references to the need for a chemical weapons convention as well. It, it's specifically mentioned in the preamble of the BWC. There's even an article, an actual one of the main articles of the BWC that talks also about the, a future chemical weapons convention and the importance of the negotiation of a chemical weapons convention is mentioned in the BWC. Um, obviously it took a lot longer for the CWC to be negotiated. I mean, that wasn't finished here in Geneva until 1992, whereas the BWC was wrapped up in 72. So another 20 years um, took place, but the CWC itself also references back to the BWC. So there are those you know, textual links already in the conventions um, themselves. There's been for a long time um, good working relationships between well between us in the implementation support unit and the, the obviously much bigger technical secretariat of the OPCW in The Hague. We work together on various different issues. Uh, we often, where we can, we attend OPCW meetings. They regularly come here and attend our meetings of experts. They brief the meetings of experts here. Um, and also attend the meeting of states parties. We've had you know, senior people coming from OPCW to BWC meetings for, for many, many years. Um, and then there are obviously scientific um, areas of, of overlap as well. I mean, one specific area is the fact that both the CWC and BWC both cover toxins. So one, one, type, of, um, you know, one type of actual agent is, is covered by both of these conventions. Um, and there's also these days a growing awareness of the kind of convergence that's taking place, the scientific convergence that's taking place between chemistry and biology. Um, so again, while we have distinct legal regimes, distinct conventions, you know, at the political and at the legal level, 
at the scientific level, the chemistry and biology are not really anymore seen as separate disciplines. Um, scientists and um, people studying, you know, at university, you know, they, they aren't really seen as, as separate disciplines anymore. There's been this kind of convergence scientifically. Um, and that also obviously has implications for, for the two conventions as well and, and means that you know, we, we and the conventions themselves and particularly states parties have to be working much more um, jointly and considering these issues um, you know, together rather than seeing these as, as separate distinct issues. Most Geneva diplomats, since the OPCW and the CWC are based in The Hague, most mm -hmm. Geneva diplomats wouldn't be working on, on that directly. But is there anything that, that they need to know about the CWC or the OPCW or if, if they're working on BWC mm -hmm. here? Um, I think, like you said, most of them will be focused on you know, the, the issues that are based here in Geneva, the conventions that are based here in Geneva. They will, I guess, have colleagues in The Hague who are you know, working on those issues as well. But I think it's good for them to have um, an awareness, obviously, that the CWC, you know, it's there and, you know, the general overview and I guess they'll, you know, get some of that through this course and then there's other information available as well about, about the OPCW. So I think it's good to have that um, general awareness and, and, as I mentioned, the, the historical kind of antecedents and, you know, the historical links between the two conventions. I think partly because, you know, the Chemical Weapons Convention was negotiated here, so at one stage, you know, everything to do with CBW, Chemical and Biological Warfare, warfare was here in Geneva. But since the OPCW was established in The Hague, you know, that's become the kind of centre of discussions on, on chemical weapons. But I think it's still, um, you know, Geneva is this kind of disarmament, you know, centre for the, the international community. So I think it's good for the people here to have knowledge of the CWC as well, even if it's not actually taking place here in Geneva. And we you know, facilitate that by having, as I mentioned before, you know, experts coming from OPCW to BWC meetings to brief states parties, you know, particularly on these relevant um, scientific aspects as well, but also on other issues because the OPCW is doing a lot in terms of implementation support, in terms of assistance and cooperation, assistance and response and preparedness. And many of our states parties, you know, we often find that at, at the national level, they consider these issues together. Many countries will have um, you know, first responders, <clears throat> excuse me, who respond to, you know, all issues. We talk about CBRN, chemical, biological, radiological and nuclear. And they will have teams for responding to those. Or they will have legislation that covers, you know, chemical and biological issues together as well. So it's at the national level, I think many of these issues are also joined up. Again, you know, despite the fact that internationally we now have these distinct regimes, there is a lot of um, crossover and overlap. So I think, again, it's good even if people here won't be working specifically on CWC issues, it's good for them to have that knowledge, to know that it's there and to know that there are these pretty close links, both historically and, and practically and scientifically as well. All right. Well, uh, I will finish there, but I'd, I guess you'd like to remind everyone that you and your colleagues at the ISU are at their disposal if they want to come and see you or call you up or send you an email with questions about the BWC. Exactly, exactly. We're here. We're not necessarily physically present much at the moment, given that everyone is, is still working from home quite often. But yeah, we're obviously reachable via, via email. You know, we have a website um, or a, a section of the ODA Geneva website as well. So we're, yeah, we're obviously here to, to answer questions, to advise and to give any guidance that we can as well. Okay, great, thank you very much. Thank you. That was our video for module two on weapons of mass destruction. The next module is on cross-cutting issues, including gender, the humanitarian perspective on disarmament and financing aspects. So we look forward to seeing you there.